13 years old. And so as I was asked to prepare this, it was a little bit intimidating to be dealing with people that have been here and worked in the church for 40 or 50 years. And so as I kind of went back, I started out by thinking, you know, I have memories of my dad, sure, that are beyond a lot of you folks, but uh, I did need to research this. So of course, I spent a lot of time talking with my mother. I consulted with uh, Ken and Seeger. Um, I got in touch with Father Tom Campbell uh, up in uh, Spearfish. And I talked with Father Webster Tuhawk over in White River. And uh, consulted with uh, Virginia Selecta over the parish office in Sioux Falls. And of course, our own beloved Virginia driving hawk, Sneedy, wrote a book in the 70s about the history of the Episcopal Church since its inception here. And I, I present this up to you as a wonderful, wonderful resource if you want to get a little sense of, of whence we've come. I want to, first of all, also recognize it's pretty cool uh, not knowing that on this particular day, that of the six of us in my family, of course my father has passed, but four of us are here of the remaining five of the family. The only one that's not here is my little sister Kristen. And uh, I want to recognize my mother Marilyn, my uh, oldest sister Lenora Mahara from Texas, and my sister Leah uh, from the Phoenix area. And uh, they're here in Rapid to help Marilyn <coughs> make the next transition in her living situation, which is West Hills. And they've been here all week working to get that to move just as, as perfect as it can be. So I recognize you and all your guests and all the people that have consulted on this along the way. It's a little intimidating, you know, the son of somebody that's as big a person as my father is to, to come and talk about him. And that was pretty humbling for me. My dad was born December 25th, 1928. He was a Christmas baby. He shared his birth with Christ. And I know that that was a big influence on in him. A lot of people always ask my dad, didn't you feel cheated about your birthday? And of course, he never did. He thought it was absolutely wonderful. And his family growing up always recognized not only Christmas, but him as a Christmas baby and celebrated birthday. So it was a pretty pretty wonderful thing. And I know that that had an impact on how he looked at life and, and who he was. His uh, parents were Anne and Harry Jones. I'm going to circulate some pictures along the way here. Les is going to help me. Uh, these are my, my, uh, my dad's uh, parents. And Harry and Anne had four children. There were two girls and two boys. My dad was the third in the line of children. He was born in 28, and so his life started. And as he grew, it was in the time of the Depression, which many of you recognize as well. There were very hard times. And at a very young age, my dad was working to help support the livelihood of the family and to maintain their subsistence. He, uh, he was born in the community of St. Boniface. Manitoba, which is a suburb of Winnipeg, metropolitan Winnipeg. And it's right on the banks of the Red River. And that was a very dear and important place to be. <coughs> During his young uh, childhood, he was involved in working as a paper boy. And he was so reliable and so hardworking that he instantly kind of developed a niche and started getting other kids to work under him to kind of coordinate this. And he was quite a responsible person right as a small child and kind of got huge work at him. And that was something that was a big part of who he was and was certainly great in us as children in the family. He was very active in the Boy Scouts. He was, um, he loved the outdoors, he loved the scouting program, of course it was but interesting enough, his, uh, his ecumenicalism started even at that age because in those days, uh, Boy Scout troops were sponsored by churches. And so if you were a Lutheran church goer, 
were expected to go to the Lutheran church and there be in their troop, etc. My dad said, you know, these guys are all buddies in this neighborhood. We're gonna should, we should welcome them into our church. And and so he worked really hard and was very vocal about those ecumenical kind of things that bring people together. And that was something that was a, a big thing for him right from the early days on.
up again, Second World War, it was a very big influence. And uh, I think that played a big part in his decision uh, for the ministry. He actually started uh, college, uh, University of Manitoba, St. John's College. And he started in Forest Street. And about a year after his greetings, uh, uh, Judge Tax, it's great to see you here. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, so uh, he started in forestry, and uh, he, uh, after a year, just uh, found that he was called to uh, theology. And uh, that was a, a big move for him, and he, he embraced that 100%. Now, during his college years, a lot of people thought it was quite ironic that someone who was embracing faith and religion would make their college money by instilling uh, lightning rods <laughs> on uh, buildings in, in southern Manitoba. But there was maybe a little bit of irony that was happening. But he would uh, put lightning rods on uh, barns and, uh, and uh, all sorts of grain elevators so that the huge prairie storms would not burn these buildings down. He made quite a bit of money for that, and I think possibly that might have been his uh, highest income in his life. I'm not quite <laughs> sure, but he, he was always thankful for those opportunities. And as children, we traveled with him across southern Manitoba. He would always point out, you know, in such and such a year, I put lightning rods on that, and so and so just fell off, and on and on. But it was always fun to see the buildings and structures that he had put these lightning rods on. My dad met my mother at a church function for youth and ministry in a planning session. And uh, she was the love of, of my dad's wife. She was his soulmate. And uh, it's reported that after this meeting on this blustery evening, he came back to his dorm room and, and announced to his, uh, his roommate, well, I have met the woman I have been married. <laughs> and of course, uh, his uh, his roommate, you know, kind of checked Marilyn out and kind of scouted her up, and he said, "Well, I'll give you three weeks." You <laughs> <laughs> can see, you can see that it's gone pretty well. They were married for over 50 years, and what they say is very much true. Behind every good man is a very good woman, and Marilyn, uh, she was there and supported his ministry from all the people he brought into our home to feed, to sewing on buttons, to getting his shirts, everything. And, and she was by his side uh, down the road on every journey. And, and without her, his ministry would be far from incomplete. Um, that's true. <laughs> So he got married to Marilyn on August 25th, 1951. Earlier in that year, with May the 20th, he was ordained to be a deacon. And a year uh, later, 1952, June the 8th, he was ordained as a priest in the Anglican Church in the Diocese of Brandon. Now, shortly after their marriage, they got all their possessions on a train. They headed up to northern Canada. They uh, went to a little town called Flin Flon, Manitoba. And that is 600 miles north of Winnipeg. I've heard tell that they remember temperatures of 52 below zero without a wind chill. It kind of was like Siberia. But in that five years uh, in uh, Flin Flon, they um, started St. Peter's Church and they had two children, my dear sister Lenore and Leah, so they were born there in Winnipeg. And then, uh, uh, for those of you that don't know, we were born in Flip Flop, rather. Um, I'm going to send a picture of my dad around for those of you that didn't know him personally. And then I'm going to send another picture. This is him in front of the cathedral where he was ordained as a priest in Grand so they went from Flin Flon after five years down to Winnipeg. That was 1956, and their son was born down there. And uh, I was a kid that had a lot of asthma troubles. And during the first couple of years of my life, I was hospitalized almost continuously. 
During this time, I thought I was the reason that we were going to the United States, and I was already pretty proud of that. It's not like Bishop Gessner, who preceded my father, uh, had kind of gotten a word from my, about my dad from another priest who was serving up in Aberdeen. And uh, so Bishop Gessner was in kind of pursuit of my dad and contacted him a couple times, I understand. And with my health issues, it was advised that we moved to kind of a drier climate. So, um, on the third attempt, Bishop Gessner apparently said, you know, it's like baseball, three strikes, you're out. And uh, with me as an excuse, we headed into Mitchell, South Dakota. And uh, uh, it was a great place for me, and it was a wonderful place for my father to serve St. Mary's in Mitchell for five years. And during that time, he had the pleasure of meeting Judge Tyson back here. Judge Tyson is one of his Boy Scouts, and he has lots of stories to tell. <laughs> You'll have to arrange those on another day. But, uh, I might suggest maybe over a little bit of wine. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so from Mitchell, uh, 1963, my dad went to Sioux Falls and was the administrative assistant to Bishop Gessner. It was during that time that my dad really developed quite a state presence. Uh, as the administrative uh, assistant, I'm told that uh, he uh, was really the one that was the hand of Bishop Gessner that really dealt with all the pastoral kinds of issues that were kind of kind of muddy and kind of tough within the, within the church. And uh, and so he kind of got a reputation of going to the different areas and kind of working to resolve the conflict in the area that was really um, very respectful of all the people involved. Um, then came Bishop Olby, who was uh, the retired bishop out of the Philippines. And at that time, the, the, the South Dakota church was a missionary district, meaning that we were not self-supported. We were supported by the national church. Um, and Bishop Ogilvy and Bishop Gessner and the predecessors had all been appointed and directed in the South Dakota in the past. And uh, Bishop Ogilvy came in and was uh, put in place to follow um, Bishop Gessner. And um, about that time, as that process happened, my dad felt the need to kind of be removed. So we left and went to North Dakota, Bismarck, for a couple of years. And uh, in 1969, my dad was elected as uh, the Dean of Calvary Cathedral. He came back to Sioux Falls, we were there for about a year. And as the diocese was making a transition from a missionary district to the diocese, which would have been about 69, 70, 71, a Bishop Ogilvy really felt that the people of South Dakota should have the opportunity to uh, elect their own bishop rather than just have that bishop appointed and having been that. So he is a very wise person, set up the process to have an election. And in uh, the spring of 1970, uh, uh, a convention was held in Peter to elect a bishop. There were 15 candidates on that. And uh, the process all occurred. And in the 13th ballot, uh, my dad was elected as the seventh uh, bishop of South Dakota, but the first of the diocese, the actual non-missionary district, but the independent diocese of South Dakota. Uh, he's 41 years old, and uh, at that time he was one of the youngest bishops in the uh, Church of the United States. He'd been a priest for 20 years during that time. And he was consecrated on the 25th of July, 1970, at the Nyberg Convocation in Pine Ridge. And that was outside under the boughs of the pine booths that were always at uh, convocations. And the temperature that day was over 100 degrees. Oh. And I'm going to send a few pictures around here you will enjoy looking at. These are kind of pictures of the family at about the age we were when he was a bishop. And also some of the actual pictures of the convocation and the consecration. Um, my dad insisted on being consecrated, not in the temple of, of the cathedral. He wanted to be out there where ministry occurred, and he wanted to be out there with the people he loved. My dad is probably best known, as I read 
that we all the obituaries and things. It's probably the best known for two things, his work with the native people and his work on stewardship. He loved the native people. He had a deep spirit. He appreciated their deep spirituality. He had generosity, um, humility, and good humor. I'm getting the five minute already for Tim Peterson. And I'm just going to go this morning. So I'm going to wrap this up. Just hey, you told me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you get to be thrown under the bus now. <laughs> that in his first act as bishop of the new diocese of South Dakota, he went back and said, well, I have a whole different plan here. And that is, we're going to change fiscal policy. Instead of the diocese asking parishes and chapels for a certain amount, we're going to let each of those parishes and chapels decide for themselves what their gift to the, uh, and pledge to the diocese is going to be. He trusted the chapels. Tested the congregations and that worked out amazingly well. Um, one of his uh, big passions was what's called Coalition 14, and that was, uh, he was one of the founding members of that, and that was an organization of 14 dioceses that got together. And those dioceses nationally got together in a collegial fashion, and their goal was to set goals together to appropriate resources and to identify what the mission and outreach needs of the church would be. So instead of fighting, he really worked to kind of get the church as a group to kind of work together to identify priorities. Another uh, very important thing that he favored was the Dakota Leadership Program, and that was a program that raised up ministry right from the native, uh, from the native people. He, um, Prior to that, there had been a lot of perpetual deacons in our diocese, and he raised up education for people within the community that were seen as leaders. And he, um, uh, the DLP, then ordained these men as uh, priests. We got a lot of folks like um, um, like Noah Broken Leg and um, Les Campbell, Father Ron Campbell. Uh, this was such a good program that we had a bunch of people that came out of that and the, and the Diocese of Alaska kept stealing them. We lost some great people who came fish out of Alaska. David Cochran, George Harris, and uh, Steve Charleston. A year and a half later, after he was ordained, he felt so strongly about making ministry that he got Tim Grandpa involved to, in, in becoming in that process of electing uh, a suffering bishop to, to be an assistant. Tim will tell you that his grandpa was the first ever native uh, person as a bishop in, 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 the, in the church, so it was pretty, pretty wonderful. He was very committed to seminary students. Uh, and Cedar talks about my dad and all the, all the kind of um, um, communication that he had constantly. And he was always there to support, made a lot of frequent visits, and, and was there to be at the graduation and those kind of things. But the big thing about my dad, in his position, he was very strong and committed to the canon law of the church. But as Canon Cedar indicated, he was always dealt with reprimand in a compassionate, loving manner, which respected the integrity of each individual. And that was a big deal. The youth ministry was big. All the expansion of Thunderhead Episcopal Camp. Um, John Kervich talks about how after the big fundraiser built the new uh, structure, uh, my dad called him to his office and said, John, come and see you when you're in town. And uh, uh, he asked John to build a chapel at the, at the church camp. And John, of course, said, the whole church camp, or the whole chapel, and of course he did that. And, uh, and so uh, then they had the big celebration of the new chapel, and John enjoyed telling me that as he went in and sat down, the big celebration was at the place of honor, and sat down on this chair, and the chair immediately broke into pieces. <laughs> I said, so I got not only the picture of the chapel, but I had the opportunity to buy all the furniture. <laughs> During his ministry, during that time, it was a tumultuous time. We had wounded me in the, the takeover, 71-day occupation. My dad was in the 
negotiator during that time. He had in and out uh, um, free pass. The FBI called him the Purple Chief. And during that time, he had an opportunity to interact with our beloved Judge Bogue and Judge Bob. And he had an impact on, on those folks as well. I mean, he, was, um, he was so proud of, of the way that these judges understood and accepted the difference, the cultural differences, and how, how fair they were in dealing with the offenses of these young uh, Native people. And so that was big. During the flood of 1972, uh, the uh, church had a huge response. Uh, the flood occurred on Friday, and the very next day, the, the presiding bishop of the National Church was here with a check for over $50,000 immediately meet the needs of this community. And, and during that time, he, he had a very big impact in the healing as, as Tim's grandpa did in dealing with all the sorrow and brokenness that came out of that flood. He, um, he dealt with things, the conflict like the new hymn of women priests, and uh, always that wrestling and always that thing that always uh, continues on in, in every generation. And I heard across, uh, uh, was um, during his uh, his time as bishop, the Niagara Cross came from something that was given only to the native people during during the time of, um, of baptism and confirmation, and, and the uh, the uh, Niagara Deanery uh, elected to give that to everybody that was confirmed, and that was a big thing. Mother Marilyn was the first uh, white woman to receive the Niagara Cross during that time. And it was a very exciting time, the, the reunion or the building of, of cultures in a way that was wonderful. In closing, I want to say just one thing. Uh, when we opened this forum, we talked about the importance of these kind of things. It kind of tells us from whence we've come, and it also hopefully gives us a chance to look at what the direction we need to go in the future. I think from my dad's ministry and from his time of service are the few things we take. What do we need to do? I think it was clear. His example was we feed the hungry. We love unconditionally. We trust God to resolve conflict in our changing world and the church. And we trust God to do that. And uh, we support our youth. We're generous in our giving. And that we raise up and support within our community those that have spiritual gifts. We support them in places of seminary, let's say. And finally, I think Father Cameron said it very well, kind of summarized who my father was better than I think I ever could. At the time of my dad's funeral, he described my dad as an icon. An icon, an icon is something that you focus on and focuses back on you. And it is a window to God. And I think of all the, the descriptions and kind of images, uh, my father really was a person of generosity and kindness and unconditional love. And his gifts were very, very unique, but he had a way of drawing people into the spirituality of the real being. Well, I thank you for the opportunity.